Greetings, viewer. Eric the Car Guy here with another fun-filled repair video for you. And today we have a 1997 Nissan Altima. I believe it has a 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine in it. It has a check engine light on and the engine runs a little bit rough or what the complaints of it are. Whenever confronted with a performance problem and a check engine light, I think the first step is basically to go in and pull that code and find out what you got and take it from there. This being a 97, it means it's an OBD2 vehicle, which means we can plug our DLC into the computer and pull the codes. And on this car, it's actually located up underneath near the hood latch. Sorry, it's a little dark there, but it's this connector right here. Now that the scanner is plugged in, it lights up when I plug it in. Next step is to turn the key to the on position. And on this scanner, all I've got to do is push that little button. We have three codes. All fairly straightforward. We have the P0100, which is a MAF sensor code. We have a P0325, which is a NOx sensor code, and we've gone there before. Uh, and we also have a P0304, which is a misfire. So we've got a few things that could indicate a, uh, why our engine is not uh, running smoothly. Uh, the misfire being one of them. Knock sensor not so much, but the MAF sensor, yes. I'm going to begin my diagnosis with the MAF sensor to start with, get a look at it, get a look at its wiring, and uh, see if I can figure out what's going on with that. Now, this car only has 86,000 miles on it, and it's, well, as you can see, very, very clean under here, uh, the way everything looks. MAF sensor is located here. I think we might just start with just a cleaning. I think I might just take it off there and clean it and stick it back on uh, and see what I get. Actually, before I remove the, the MAF sensor, what I'm going to do is a test that's not so scientific. Uh, if there's a loose connection or a connection problem in that MAF sensor, uh, a lot of times if you just tap on it with like the handle of a screwdriver, uh, it will, and if it starts to act up, that could give you an indication that there's maybe a connection issue or something in the MAF sensor and that it should be replaced. What a fair amount of noise from what sounds like the alternator. You can see it running rough. Do you see that change? alternator bearing doesn't sound so great if that's what that noise is but I did notice a change when I when I hit the math sensor when I tapped on it so perhaps we're on to something there but I'm still gonna remove it inspect it get a look at it and then uh, we'll sort of take our diagnosis from there they've actually made this sensor fairly easy to remove um, actually was it even plugged in all the way there's just uh, two Phillips head screws Okay, that screw snapped. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I should try a different approach. All right, since the screw snapped, I'm just gonna take the whole assembly off. Looks like we got a new air filter, that's nice. All right, now here's the air filter slash MAF sensor assembly. This, like I said, I broke that screw off when I tried to remove it, so I didn't try to remove the second screw. Because this is, if this isn't bad, we don't necessarily want to take it off. But looking down inside here, you can see the mass sensor lives in that hole right there. And I don't know if I can get you in there or not. Okay, now I've got my light. You can see a little better. What you're looking at is that wire that's down there. That's really the MAF sensor, and what it does is it measures the incoming air uh, and calculates, and the computer calculates a fuel mixture based on that reading that it, that it gives. Now, um, sometimes it's actually set to be self cleaning, but sometimes there can be a little dirt or something that, that gets on there that could cause those readings to uh, be anomalous. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spray a little bit of cleaner on it. 
There was some de debate in the past in another video that I did about spraying these with uh, just regular throttle cleaner because there is a special uh, cleaner just for MAF sensors uh, about it leaving some kind of residue. I haven't found that to be an issue. Um, so I'm just going to use my throttle cleaner like I have in the past and just to clean it up like that. And that's, that's all I'm doing. And I'm going to reinstall this on the vehicle and see if uh, the idle changes at all. Uh, and if it does, it might indicate that we do have an issue here with this map sensor. I'm also going to tighten this down again. And I'm mostly doing that because if there's any air leaks after the mass airflow sensor, that can upset the, the fuel mixture because it's air that wasn't accounted for by the sensor. So you want to make sure there aren't any holes or leaks or cracks or anything in the tube that goes from the engine to the air cleaner housing after the mass airflow sensor because once again, that's, that's air that wasn't measured by the mass sensor, so it's, it'll run lean as a result. For a second there, it was running smoother, but now it's gone back to its ways of, of missing. Okay, I'm gonna admit to tinkering around with this a little bit before I went for the uh, uh, spec for the MAF sensor, because, you know, that voltage reading seemed pretty good, and even though I unplugged it and everything seemed to smooth out and be fine, it still acts like a cylinder misfire to me. And something that I personally know about Nissans is they oftentimes, at least of this vintage, have problems with fuel injectors. So what I'm gonna do is sort of switch gears on you and I'm gonna do a power balance test, basically see if, if all the cylinders are putting out power. So in a previous video I showed disconnecting the ignition coils. Uh, the video that I had showed each one of the ignition coils had a, had a plug to it so I could disconnect them. In this particular style, if I did that, if I'd use the ignition system, I'd have, you know, basically voltage going nowhere or into me and it might get the, I might get the snot shocked out of me. So instead of doing that, what I propose is, is I'm going to disconnect each one of these fuel injector uh, connectors one at a time. And if there's no appreciable drop in engine RPM as I disconnect one or more of these, then I know that that cylinder is not working. But what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the RPMs to drop and the engine to start to run rough. If it does nothing, that could indicate that that cylinder is not firing or there's some issue there. But with this misfire on cylinder number four, and this might also affect the MAF sensor as well, um, I'm actually thinking that uh, cylinder number four fuel injector is having an issue. So uh, let's prove that out. All right, so the premise of this test is fairly simple. I'm going to unplug each one of the injector connectors one at a time while the engine is running. And what I'm looking for is the RPM should drop um, <laughs> to some degree whenever I unplug one of those because in essence what I'm doing is I'm turning off the fuel to that cylinder. So if I, if I pull the plug on one cylinder and nothing happens, it means that likely either it's missing spark or missing fuel. You really don't know which but you do know you would be able to find a problem cylinder if that were the case. Let's start with number one. See how that really started running rough? Okay, now it's gotten a little better. Also starting to run rough. Now it's running better. Again, I'm noticing about the same RPM drop. It's starting to roughen out. Back up when I plug it in. No real change. No change. I think there's an issue with this injector. And again, what I, I can do a couple of things. One of the things I'm gonna try to do is tap on it with my screwdriver again.
that's not doing anything. Let's get my stethoscope and give a listen to it. I'm gonna use my mechanic stethoscope to listen to it, the clicking of each one of the injectors. To me, it sounded like they were all working. I mean, it was like, the, the sound sounded a little bit different, but they all sounded like they were doing something. So the next thing I wanna try and do is I'm gonna pull out um, the spark plugs, particularly cylinder number four, and get a look at them, just to see if, if there's any abnormalities that I can see there. Well, there's something right there that's kind of interesting. See this little white burn spot? That could mean that this wire is actually arcing to the inside of that tube. And if that's the case, it will cause a misfire. It could be an ignition problem and have nothing to do with the fuel injectors because I heard all the fuel injectors working. These are very loose. <clears throat> At least they're NGK, so they're the right plugs. It's looking a little bit crusty. This one looks a little more normal. Still got a little bit of that crust on there, that, that tan stuff, but this is, this is normal. This is a nice, normal looking plug. Once again, nice, normal looking plug. It looks like, uh, well, Actually, it looks fine. Plug looks new, too. Same deal on cylinder number one. They all look pretty much the same. But when I compare these to cylinder number four, this being cylinder number four here, cylinder number four's porcelain, the white porcelain part, doesn't really look as shiny as the other ones do. There's another one that you can see comparison to. This over on the right is cylinder number four, and this is cylinder number two that's next to it. Oh, I'm sorry, that was cylinder number three. This is cylinder number two. You can see that there's just a little bit of discoloration on cylinder number four here. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna soak these wires down with a little bit of water while it's running to see if I can get it to miss. Uh, and if I do, uh, it may just be a set of uh, high tension leads or ignition wires that fixes this. Now I'm gonna start the engine up and I'm gonna spray these wires down with a little bit of water and look for arcing. Doesn't look like there's any change and I'm not seeing any arcing. Okay, now I've swapped out the ignition wire with a known good ignition wire. And I'm just gonna see if that makes a difference in how it runs. Doesn't really look like it runs that much better. We need to find out what's going on with cylinder number four. This is interesting though. I just plugged the old ignition lead back in and it seems to be running worse. I'm gonna take the distributor cap off next. I'm gonna use this setup. I have a uh, quarter inch ratchet with a Phillips head on the end. Okay, here's my cap. This terminal right here 
on the end is cylinder number four. I'm just seeing like a lot of corrosion and stuff in here, or just, just a lot of normal buildup like this cap hasn't been changed in a while. So I'm actually wondering, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for like lines that, like I said, this is cylinder number four. I'm looking for like maybe just little lines that almost look like small cracks on the inside of here, and that's referred to as carbon tracking. And what can happen with carbon tracking is it can actually short the ignition circuit out uh, because the spark will follow that, that line rather than follow, you know, go into the uh, ignition wire and, and head down to the spark plug. It'll take the shortest path to ground pretty much. And if it's, if it's got those lines, those carbon tracking inside the cap, then what happens is um, it, in essence, shorts out the ignition uh, for that particular cylinder or cylinders and you get an engine mess similar to what we've got here. But the more I'm looking at this and the more I mess with it, the more I realize that there's, there's a change every time I do something with the ignition system. So given that um, it's not going to be overly expensive to start with, I believe I'm just going to start with an ignition tune-up. I'm just going to, I'm actually just going to do the cap rotor and wires. Uh, the spark plugs look brand new. They're NGKs. I don't really have any motivation to replace them So I think I'm just gonna start with that and then see what I have and since I'll be doing my ignition rotor In addition to the cap what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna keep bumping the engine over until I get the uh, rotor to cut to line up Now the screws up and it's gonna be easy for me to get to all right since it'll be simple enough to swap out this cap rotor and wires I'm just gonna go ahead and do that now Now these are all numbered in case you uh, have trouble getting the wires and stuff back on. The ignition wires, as you'll see, are also numbered. But I think I got everything out of the way and looking good. Still not quite there. It's, it's still cylinder number four that has an issue. Okay, well, since our ignition system didn't seem to solve it, that leaves mechanical and fuel. Uh, so I'm going to try something rather unorthodox, and I'm just going to pinch off the return line on the fuel on the fruit fuel rail. And what that's going to do is that's going to send maximum fuel pressure through the system. If the idle smooths out, then I know there's a fuel issue. There is a change. Hmm. You know what? We can do something. I can check the resistance of the windings of the injector itself. If the resistance is off, then I can condemn the injector right off the bat. Or the injector, it doesn't look like this engine got run a whole lot. So it might just be clogged up a little bit and maybe I can run some fuel injector cleaner through it and fix it that way or I might have to replace it. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna try to determine if it's a mechanical problem with the fuel injector, like it's clogged up or if perhaps there's an electronic problem with it. So what I've done is I've got my DVOM out. I'm gonna set it for checking resistance and I'm gonna put it on the auto ranging scale. Um, it's only when you're checking circuits that like have super high resistance that you're you can take it off of auto ranging, but for the most part, I think stuff for, for stuff like this, auto ranging will work fine. And it also makes it easy, so you don't have to like know what's going on with the circuit. But I'm just going to check the uh, resistance of my leads, and it looks like I've got uh, about half an ohm or so of resistance in my leads themselves, so I can factor that in whenever I'm I'm checking this. So the first thing I'm going to check is I'm going to check number one cylinder because that's known good, and then I'll check number four. Okay, I got about 11.6, 11 ohms. That's my known good.
This one also has about the exact same resistance and you have to unplug the injector in order to get a proper resistance reading. So it, it has the correct resistance uh, that it should have. If, if it was slightly more than that or something, I would think that there was something going on with it. So maybe it's just clogged. So step two is I'm going to run some fuel injector cleaner through this and see if that improves anything. All right, well, I haven't taken you through the entire process, but basically I've hooked up my my OTC fuel injection cleaning setup. And what it is, is you put cleaner inside of here, you run compressed air into the top. This is an air pressure regulator and you regulate the pressure going in. This should actually be about 35 PSI, but because the last vehicle I worked on was uh, more than that, it's up to 40 right now and I can dial that in. So this fuel pressure is a little high right now, but it should be somewhere between 34 and 40 according to uh, the specs I got in the book. Uh, that cleaner comes out this hose and basically goes into the feed for the fuel rail. What I've done is I've pinched off the return line on that to make sure that it doesn't all go back to the tank. In addition to all this, I've pulled the fuel pump fuse. Uh, there's a 15 amp fuse in the under dash fuse box. Uh, it's way up at the top here on this side. Um, you can sort of, well, it got blurry there for a second. So right up here on, on this side, on the inner thing, is where the fuel pump fuse is. It's listed on the outside there, and then I verified that by turning the key on and listening for the pump, and I didn't hear it run. So now that I have all of this stuff set up, I'll be able to run the engine on my cleaner instead of the gasoline. I prefer this method rather than dumping things into the tank. Uh, mostly because if you dump some kind of cleaner into the tank, it's also going to clean all the sediment and everything out of the tank and send it up through the fuel system. Personally, I'd rather jump in here, uh, use this pressurized cleaner. I've had a lot of success with this. And really from this point on, it's just a matter of dialing in the, the pressure and starting the engine. Um, it's, it's pretty much all we've got to do. We just run the engine until it's out of cleaner and hopefully our mist will go away. My fuel pressure is right where I want it to be. It came down a little bit. And hopefully my cleaner will be effective. When it gets low on the cleaner, it starts to run rough and then it'll stall. When it stalls, I know it's out of cleaner. This video just isn't about like cleaning fuel injectors. That'll be in another video. This is just basically showing you part of a diagnostic process that I'm going through trying to figure out how to fix this mess. We just ran out of cleaner and hence ran out of fuel. Okay, well, it looks like I uh, struck out again. I'm a little disappointed in myself for not checking for mechanical. But at this point, we gotta check for mechanical. It just dawned on me uh, what this problem could be, and I'm about to verify it right here. And this might give you a little hint. It's throttle plate cleaner. Uh, the fact that you raise the RPM and everything smooths out should be just like the biggest clue and the most punch in the face that I could possibly have. Uh, and for those of you that uh, know what that means, well, what that probably means is a vacuum leak, and given that uh, cylinder number four in the balance test uh, showed me that it was producing less power, I suspect that that's where our problem is. And then that is something that will also set the MAF sensor off, um, because once again, that's air that the MAF sensor did not account for, so it would set a code for that. So this could knock out misfire number four and the MAF sensor code. Knock sensor code is still up in the air, but what I want to do is I want to fix this problem first and then clear the codes and then take it for a drive and then see where we're at. Uh, if that knock sensor code comes back, I'll pursue that further. If not, well, knock sensor is like non-essential uh, to the operation of the vehicle, but it can affect engine performance. Uh, by design, it's there to detect engine knock. When it does, it starts retarding ignition timing, so that would equate to a loss of power. So if that was bad, that's what would happen. But it's there as a matter of self-preservation. So it's not like 
It's not like, oh no, you're gonna die or not be able to get to where you're going if uh, there's a knock sensor failure. So why don't we uh, start the car up and check for vacuum leaks on the intake runner on cylinder number four and see what we have. Okay, it's still running rough. And guess what smooths it out? I don't need to see anymore. Well, it looks like this video is gonna have a part two where I replace the intake gasket on this. I think what I'll do is I'll split this video up and I'll make uh, fixing the intake gasket a separate video and this will be the diagnosis of that and we'll see uh, how our engine runs after we take care of that issue. This is a pretty definitive test if you spray carburetor cleaner or you can use water if you're worried about fire, you have to be very careful. I'll post a link in the description to the video I did originally about finding vacuum leaks. I guess we'll wrap this one up for now and we'll come back to it to actually have a conclusion. So uh, I won't close this video out yet until we've replaced that intake gasket and then we can call it done and fixed because uh, we like to take things to the point where they're fixed here. I'll catch you in a little bit. She's all better. No more shaking, no more moving. No more check engine light. I turn those out too. Let's wrap this up. Okay, we certainly learned our lesson on that one. I'm, I'm just gonna go and just say that, that I kind of dropped the ball on this one. Uh, the intake gasket uh, replacement video is gonna be, I'll post a link in the description to that, but that is what cured this, uh, this rough running engine and cured the P0304 misfire code. Um, as far as the P0325, that knock sensor is kind of difficult to get to and it's possible that the misfire might have been setting that code or at least I'm going to go on that assumption for now. So I'm just going to back off that, that code at the moment. Uh, I've done another video on a PO325 diagnosis. I'll also post a link in the description to that uh, so you can check that one out. But uh, the, main, the main thing that I take away that I'd like you to get from this video is, is as far as misfire diagnosis. This is just one possible cause. Uh, misfires come in all shapes and sizes. And in addition to that, I have to say that, that not all misfires are accurate. What I mean when I say that is, if you get like say in the, in the case like this, a P0304, it may not necessarily mean that cylinder number four is at fault. And the reason why I say this is because misfire d codes are set based on like crank and camshaft readings that are, that are being sent to the, to the computer. And the computer's not always so accurate at picking up exactly what cylinder is misfiring. And you may have misfires across multiple cylinders and it's trying to keep up with that. Pretty much what the computer does is it looks at the acceleration every time there is a power stroke uh, in the engine. So every time a piston's going down in the power stroke, the computer anticipates that signal speeding up and, and getting a certain amount of acceleration from that. If it doesn't see that acceleration, it says, aha, that cylinder's gotta be misfiring. But as I said, it's really difficult for the computer to gauge sometimes specifically what cylinder is at fault. So when you do your misfire diagnosis, don't just zero in on the cylinder that, that you have a misfire for. Look at, look at the engine as a whole. Let's just, let's just talk quickly about misfires. This one, this one is gonna be a vacuum leak and there's, there's so much stuff with misfire diagnosis that, that this is probably not the only video that I'll do along with this. But let's, let's talk about intake vacuum leaks. Now, what should have screamed like a neon sign to me is with this vehicle as far as the misfire was concerned and it being a vacuum leak was the fact that the misfire would go away when I open the throttle. If the misfire goes away when you're opening the throttle, there's a real good chance you've got a vacuum leak somewhere. And the reason I say this is because of how intake vacuum works. The way intake vacuum works is it's highest at closed throttle at idle. So you have the most intake vacuum at idle. So if you've got an intake vacuum leak or something like that, it's gonna be the worst at idle. But the more the throttle opens, the closer you get to wide open throttle, the more intake vacuum drops off to almost zero. So if you have an issue with like say an intake vacuum leak like this vehicle did, the minute you go to raise the RPM, 
that mist goes away because intake vacuum is no longer as prevalent as it is at idle at closed throttle. So that should scream like a neon sign. You might want to, you know, use whatever method. I, I use my brake clean. Some people use water. Some people uh, put smoke inside the intake. There, there's a lot of different methods for that. I have a video on, you know, also on how I look for intake vacuum leaks that I'll post a link to as well. So you, you'll get tons of links down there, including a link over at my forum for a discussion on this video. So if you want to talk about this video further, or you have questions, there'll be a link in the description to the forum discussion about this very video. And also the video will be posted in that forum over uh, at ericthecarguy.com. If it's not an intake misfire, let's say it's an ignition misfire. A lot of times in my experience, like uh, something with the ignition system, like the spark plugs, the wires, the cap, the rotor, a coil pack, depending upon what kind of setup you have, uh, that will happen under load. So as you accelerate, the miss will get worse and worse. It seems for, for whatever reasons, uh, ignition misfires, at least in my experience, really seem to show up like when you're accelerating, when you're going up a hill, something like that. Uh, something else that could come into play is EGR, but I don't want to go too far into that because I have seen EGR problems cause misfire codes in the past. And that basically goes along with the, the mixture issue. This is why I say that misfires come in all shapes and sizes. The vacuum leak is like a mixture issue. Uh, EGR problem, also a mixture issue. Uh, different things like that can cause it. And, and getting to the fuel system would be the next thing if, say for instance, that fuel injector actually was bad. That miss would happen all the time. As I raised the RPMs, as I tried to accelerate, that miss would always be there. If that, if that fuel injector was dead, 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 most likely it's going to be across the board. Like, like that cylinder will miss every single time that fuel injector is supposed to fire and it's not. That cylinder just doesn't get the fuel, it misses. Now lastly we have say a mechanical issue, something outside of mixture issue like a vacuum leak or something like that. Say you've got like a burned up valve, an exhaust valve or something like that that's causing a loss of compression. Or there's uh, broken piston rings or, or anything like that that could cause a loss of compression that equates to a misfire. Think back to that uh, Chevy Tahoe I put the engine in. They had the misfire on cylinder number six and we did the leak down test and we found that that particular cylinder was way, way down on, on compression and its ability to hold uh, any kind of any kind of compression so therefore we had a miss and it was mechanically related so once again misfires come in all shapes and sizes so don't rule anything out follow the evidence don't don't make assumptions uh, you make assumptions it's going to get expensive for your customers and for you and it makes you a better technician to to actually follow through with things like this and 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 find out what the real problem is but I, I hope that little extra bit of information for this for this video gives you, you know, just that little bit extra that, that might just get you to pause for a second before you start throwing parts at something and, and just give it a minute, diagnose it, do, do some checks, see if you can find vacuum leaks, see if you can find, you know, do a compression test. It's, it's not going to be that difficult. If you, if you suspect a me mechanical problem, just, just do a compression test and away you go. The PO100 code that I also got with this that I cleared, uh, I spoke with the owner and one of the things that he said that he did while it was running rough like that is he actually unplugged the MAF sensor while the vehicle was running. I'm going to say that that most likely set that code and the MAF sensor had nothing to do with any of this. But once again, it never hurts, hurts to look for those leaks in that air tube that goes from the MAF sensor to the uh, throttle body itself. Any leaks in that area, any leaks after the sensor is air that the sensor did not measure. So the computer did not calculate a fuel mixture accordingly. So if there's air getting in, the actual term is pirate air, erg. The air gets in, the computer didn't account for it, so the computer's not adding fuel, so in essence what you get is a lean misfire based on the fact that the computer said, ah, I don't know where that air came from, so screw you, no gas for you. I, I hope this information was helpful to you. Uh, once again, there will be a forum discussion. I'll put a link in the description about this video over at my website. Uh, also, if you have automotive questions, you can go to ericthecarguy.com and enter them into the search function. Just type in a couple of keywords, see if you find it there. If not, head over to the forum, ask us. We're happy to help. Uh, and you can also find me on Google+, Facebook, and Twitter. Anyway, I am going to close with be safe, have fun, and stay dirty. And stay away from those stinking assumptions. They will get you.